So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, last plenary talk. And uh, my uh, presentation will be very brief. I'd like to introduce you, uh, Mario Snyder from Uruguay, uh, who works at Northeastern University. So, Mario, thank you. Right. Thanks, um, thanks for coming. Uh, before starting, I just want to thank again the organizers. I mean, I've organized conferences. I know it's a boatload, it's a ton of work. You don't, you don't, when things go as well as I go here, you don't even realize the amount of work that goes behind the scenes. I mean, you don't realize that when things go wrong and then you start complaining. But, so, thanks Eugenio, Daniel, Joao, and Walter. So, I mean, great job. So, I mean, I will vote for as a TC chair to have Rock on here permanently <laughs> or something like that. So, okay, um, coming to my, my talk, I actually picked the title to be sort of, I mean, it's kind of a joke, it's also controversial, because of course we know that the problem is convex, it's easy, if it's non-convex, it's hard, right? So, I mean, why are we talking about this? And uh, as it turns out, the situation is not that clear, so what I want to do is, I want to show you a couple, of, or share with you a couple of thoughts that I had during the past few years. But I mean, starting with something that's a problem if you're in the robust control community. Um, if you're not in this community, if you talk to friends outside robust control, or even worse, if you talk to the funding agencies, they say, eh, robust linear control? I mean, come on, that's a solved problem, right? So we have this beautiful machinery where you put in experiments, you put in your models. On the other hand, you put in your performance specs, maybe weighting functions, you turn the crank, and this beautiful machinery spits out an LMI or an SDP. Then you turn again the crank and say interior point methods, and out of that comes a controller, and more importantly, a certificate that certi certifies that your controller meets the performance specs as long as your priors are correct, okay? So as it turns out, in the past 20 years, we worked very, very hard to put us out of work. I mean, the fact that this works doesn't mean that's actually simple. If you look inside the machinery, there's 20 years worth of research, and pretty much everyone in this room had something to do with this. And there's very sophisticated tools, I mean, starting with the Euler parameterization, the connection with interpolation theory, Nevalina Peak, uh, Nehari theorem, that's how we used to teach H infinity before the bounded real lemma came along. Then someone realized we can use separation um, hybrid plane arguments and Han Banach in infinite dimensional spaces to prove, get an LMI from mu, IQCs, and so on and so forth. So it's very sophisticated, but it's, at this point, it's totally hidden from the user. And you can argue that the same thing goes on for the optimization. I mean, now you call your favorite SCP solver, there's some sort of interior point method coded in there, it works, you don't have to worry about it, okay? So, again, we work very hard to put ourselves out of a job, okay? and it actually works really well. I mean, we had wonderful plenaries in here showing that it works for biological systems. Uh, I mean, Andres showed that it works for uh, aerospace. Um, we, we know that it also works for transportation, so it works on a whole slew of things. I mean, and you don't even have to sort of separate from the SDP from the SDP solver. I mean, if you call HINF something, the optimization is already built in, okay? So we have a tool that's extremely successful dealing with hundreds of parameters, okay? So that's it, this, this is the end of the talk. I mean, may, maybe we should all go and look for something different, okay? However, can we scale up to city size problems, okay? I mean, if you look at what's going on, say for instance, in civil engineering, everyone is talking about smart cities or more importantly, resilient cities. I mean, you have a hurricane that's coming through and you want to somehow manage your assets, your emergency services, decide how to shed power when you don't have enough generation, and so on and so forth, and you have to do this at a city size pro problem. And here's where we run into problems, because when you look at the scaling of any interior point method or SDPs, things typically scale as n cubed with n is the number of variables. So if you have an n order system, at the end of the day, you have something that scales as n power six. So the point is that we're very successful solving problems that have thousands of parameters. On the other hand, we're pushing the limit. 
I mean, if you ever try to solve an LMI that involves a matrix that's a thousand by a thousand, be prepared to wait a long time. Unless you come up with your own, say, first order methods, ADMM type things, and that still is going to take a long time. So in, that's why there's a question mark in there. I mean, I would argue that, well, we know how to solve medium sized problems, but we need to be able to scale up, okay? which is really good because personally, I have an inferiority complex. Everyone in my department, machine learning, is talking about big data and, well, also deep learning, and we can do millions of things, and we're stuck in sort of small data. So this is it. Maybe what we need to do now is put control into big data, and then we can write papers and go and talk to the funding agents saying, we're going to do control and big data. And that maybe will keep us going for the next 10 years. Okay? So maybe we should jump into the big data band one. And I mean, all those guys in there are your friends from machine learning saying, come, come, we're going to have fun, we're going to write papers and get lots of money. So let, let's jump into the big data background. And then you say, wait a minute. I mean, what is big data? So again, you talk with your friend in machine learning, and you ask her, can you tell me what's big data? You know, her, what's big data? I mean, no one knows what's big data. I mean, there are transactions in big data. You're not going to find a definition. The best definition, it's a, well, I mean, what do you do when you don't know something? You go to a source of all wisdom, right? AKA Wikipedia. So you go to Wikipedia, you find out what's in Wikipedia. And Wikipedia actually gives you a working definition. Big data, it's whatever your algorithms cannot handle. Okay? So clearly, big data, it's problem dependent. Okay? I mean, maybe big data for control is different than big data for machine learning. Okay? And well, then you turn the problem around and says, what makes data big? If we don't know what or big data is, what, what makes data big or small? Okay? So you can say, of course, big data means big data. I mean, very long feature vectors, very long output vectors. Not true. Turns out that in some control problems, I'm going to argue that big data is about 100. Okay? Now, again, you talk to your machine learning friend, and you tell her, look, for me, big data, it's 100, maybe 200. She will laugh you out of the room and say, get out of here. I mean, so we actually need to explain why, for control, big data is about 100 or 200. I mean, and there's a very good reason for that. And then once we understand why, for us, problems with maybe 200 or 300 parameters are challenging, then maybe we can do something about it, okay? So this is what I'm trying to do, at least in the first part of the talk, try to understand why, for control, or for system theory, big data is maybe just a few hundreds. Okay? And hint, dynamics. I mean, the thing that makes our problems different from regular machine learning problems, the things that make our problems really hard has to do with dynamics. Okay? So uh, coming back to the title of uh, my talk, I mean, I can start by thinking, well, what makes a problem easy? Academically, I grew up, I'm, I'm very old, I grew up in the last century when we, this LMI theory was being developed. So at that time, all sorts of wonderful things were happening, and we were extremely happy if we could show that a problem was reduced to an LMI, because then it was convex. We have a global minimum, we fit it to, at that time it was the, even the MATLAB LMI solver, where you had to call your, code your LMIs by hand. I mean, if you're old enough to remember that. But at the end of the day, we could solve problems. So convex, good, right? Turns out that's not truly the case. I mean, many people don't know that, but you could have a problem that's convex and NP-hard. NP-hard meaning that you're not gonna, unless P equals NP, you're not gonna find a polynomial time algorithm. So any problem that involves optimization over the set of copositive matrices, it's NP-hard, okay? So you cannot just say convex is easy, there are convex problems that are fundamentally hard, okay? But then you can say, get out of here. I mean, at the core, this problem is hard because it's hard to characterize a set of positive matrices. I mean, I put it down there, but essentially you have an infinite number of constraints. And so if you have an infinite number of constraints, you can say, well, that makes the problem hard, okay? So how about if we put some more requirements? How about if we say we want our problem to be co co convex, but also to be self-concordant. And 
Self-concordance came out of the work from Nestor Nemirovsky, and the importance of self-concordance is that if you show that your problem is self-concordant, then you have a bound, very tight bound, on the number of Newton iterations that you need for your integral point method to converge within a given tolerance. So self-concordance means that your integral point method, your SDP solver, is going to take only, say, 40 or 50 iterations to converge. So maybe that's the ticket. Maybe we need self-concordance and convexity. And by the way, every SDP, every LMI problem that you want to solve has a self-concordance property. Okay? So LMIs are good because we know that we can solve them in a finite number of Newton iterations. Think again. This is an actual practical problem that we had. This is a very poorly damp structure that we had at Penn State long ago for testing damage mitigating controllers. Essentially, we drill a hole in there so the structure is weakened, and then we're trying to get the mass at the end to follow a given trajectory, but if you just do an H infinity controller, there's, you excite the resonance and the thing breaks. So the, the goal here was to get the second mass to do tracking while keeping the displacement of the mass in the center bounded. Okay? In order to do that, because this has a really nasty resonance, you need, you need very good models to capture that resonance. And you need to have impose that your models are stable. Actually, there's a paper in Automatica dealing with this, and I was trying to do some design and couldn't get it to work, and then I analyzed the paper, the model they have in that paper is actually unstable. They never check, they just run subspace ID, they never check back that they got unstable. So, I mean, and in this identification problem, unless you impose stability, which you can impose yet as an LMI, you get unstable models, okay? Once you do that, you say, okay, I'm done. Let me feed this to MATLAB, Turns out that if you have about 300 points, which is barely the minimum that you need to capture the resonance, just CVX or MATLAB with any SCP solver takes about four hours. And if you try to go to 400 points, MATLAB says, I'm sorry, I quit. So maybe you can fight with your colleagues and go to the super cluster in your university, and you can push this maybe another 100 points or not. Okay? We actually got frustrated with this. We got our own ADMM first order method, and still we couldn't push it more than 400 points. Okay? So even though this is convex, self-concordant, from a practical standpoint, you cannot solve this. I mean, you can solve it only for four or 500 points. And I'm sure many of you have experience with CSID or even control design with many, many parameters, and you know that by the time your LMI gets to 1,000, by 1,000, you're really pushing what you can do. Okay. All right. So, again, this goes back to my point that in control, in convex CSID, maybe big data for us is 200 points or a few hundred points if we use this definition that big data is whatever your algorithms cannot have. Okay. So, okay, we don't know what makes a problem easy. Certainly we know what makes a problem hard, right? I mean, we've been trained to say, look, if your problem is non-convex, run away. I mean, find the smartest grad student that you can, give that problem to her, and hopefully, hopefully she will be able to solve it, but otherwise run away. Not true. Here's a problem that's not as non-convex as it gets. It's minimization of an indefinite form over the hypercube. So you take non-convex objective, because I mean it's an indefinite form, with binary variables. The variables have to be plus one or minus one. Doesn't get any harder than this, right? I mean, this is the type of problems that you run away from. I can solve this in my Mac with 100,000 variables in 50 seconds. And this is an old Mac from 2012, right? So clearly, this convex versus non-convex dichotomy doesn't capture all of the story. There's more going on in here. And what I'd like to see if is there any way that we can separate easy problems from hard problems, find out where this complexity comes from, and once we know where the complexity comes from, maybe we can use this to our advantage to make sure that we design easy problems. And as a preview, guess what? I mean, I'm going, not going to tell you because otherwise everyone will leave, but at the end of the day, the answer to here turns out to be common sense and something that we've been using in control and teaching our students for since forever. Okay? But You'll have to wait until the end of the talk to, to know the answer. Okay. But the, the key point is that 
what's going on in here, it's not convex or pseudo non convex. It has to do with some sort of hidden, sparse structure that your problem has, okay? Um, one thing that I want to make clear is I'm not poo-pooing convexity, because at the end of the day, I'm going to end up solving convex problems. But I'm going to end up solving that right convex problem. It's not that I get my LMI from my crank and I just throw an SDP solver to my LMI. You have to be smart, and smart in a very precise way. Okay? So let me to give you an, an example. Let me talk about QCQP, quadratically constrained quadratic programming. So you're trying to minimize a quadratic form of so quadratic constraints, and of course, what makes the problem interesting is that your quadratic forms are indefinite. Because if all of them are convex, then the problem is convex, it's a QP problem, you're, you're done. Right? So, how do we transform this into an SDP or an LMI? What you do is you write things in terms of a trace, you take your variable x, you vector, vectorize it, and then you take the outer product of x and x transpose, and then you call that a new variable, big uh, capital X. Now, capital X is a matrix. I mean, this is a standard relaxation of uh, QCQP, right? And then you end up with something that looks like a regular LMI. Minimize the trace of some, something times X subject to train constraints. However, the two problems are not equivalent. Firstly, you need matrix capital X to be positive semi-definite because it has to be the other product of two vectors. But to be equivalent, big X has to be also rank one. Because otherwise, once you get a solution, you cannot factor it as the other product, right? So we went from a non-convex problem hard to solve to a problem that's equally hard to solve. Because, I mean, if you put rank constraints, those are horrible constraints to handle, right? So, so far, we haven't gained anything in here. So the question is, can I get this for free? In other words, what if I drop the rank constraint? Do I still get the optimal solution? And surprisingly, the answer is yes, in some cases. And it's, again, this is related to the structure of the problem. So the actual answer is related to the topology of a graph. That's graph that's called a correlative sparsity graph. And what you do is you have one node per variable. And in the graph, you have an edge that joins two variables if there's a cross term in the objective or if the two variables appear in the same constraint. Okay? Um, so it turns out that if the graph is a tree, you can actually show that you get the rank one constraint for free. If the graph is a tree, just drop the constraint, solve the QCQP, you're done. You're guaranteed to get the optimum. So this is an example of a non-convex problem that you can actually convexify for free, provided that the underlying graph it's a tree. But it gets even better, because SDPs are hard to solve. What you can show is that if the graph is a tree, the second order comp program relaxation is exact. So instead of having to solve um, SDPs, you can solve second order comp programs which are much more efficient, and those are the ones that you can solve. And so this is how I cook my example. This example with the indefinite form or over the hypercube, if you actually do the correlative sparsity graph, it's up being a tree, so I didn't have to solve an SDP or a non-convex problem. I just solved a um, second order comp program, boom, and I can handle a lot, a uh, lot of variables. So the point here is that structure of your problem matters, sparsity in the sense of the correlative sparsity graph matters. That's a hint of what separates easy problems from hard problems, okay? So, let me talk a little bit about matrix completion. Okay? Suppose that I give you a matrix. The entries X here are given. The question marks are free variables. And I ask you, can you find the free variables so that the matrix ends up being positive semi-definite? Okay? And this is a proxy for most of the problems we're trying to solve. Okay? Of course, I can write this as an SDP. I mean, just put uh, mean one, because I mean, this is a feasibility problem subject to this positive semi-definite, feed it to CVX, you're done. But it turns out that you don't even have to solve an optimization problem to answer this. Okay? What you have to do is you have, to, again, form the, what's this correlative sparsity graph. And in here you have one node per row or column. 
And then you have an edge in the graph, is the element xij of the matrix, it's specified, you don't have an edge if you're, the element is free. So for instance, in my example, you see that there's an edge that connects one and two, because the element x12 in my matrix is actually specified. There's no edge between two and five, because if you look at the x25 entry, it's free. Okay? So, all right, fine, we can define a graph. What do we do when we have with this graph? First of all, for technical reasons, you have to do a chordal completion. A chordal graph means that every cycle on the graph is at dimension three, so I had to add that dotted line. Once I do the chordal completion, I look at the clicks in the graph, and finding clicks in a chordal graph, that's a well-known problem in computer science. Okay? So in here, I have four clicks. Each one of those, it's color-coded. So for instance, I have a click that's one, six, and five that involves the elements x11, x15, x16. So you see the correspondence between the clicks in the graph and the elements of the matrix. And here's the beautiful theorem called Drum's theorem that says that you can complete your matrix to be positive semi-definite if and only if the sub-matrices that correspond to the clicks in the graph are positive semi-definite. So we don't have to actually solve an SCP here. You just need to do a call that decomposition in your graph, check if some of your matrices are positive semi-definite, you're done. Okay? So again, you have this theme where things are related to the topology of an underlying graph. Okay? How does this help? I mean, okay, I can do matrix completion. Can I move beyond matrix completion? And the answer is yes. Suppose that I give you an SDP in primal form. You have to minimize the inner product subject to some trains constraints. What you do is you form the correlative sparsity graph for the problem where, again, you have n vertices. X here is an n by n matrix, so you have n vertices. And you have an edge if the variable xij appears either in the objective or one of the constraints. Okay? And what happens is that if the graph that you get has chordal sparsity, instead of having a huge single semi-definite constraint, you can have a collection of smaller semi-definite constraints. Who cares? Remember, n power six scaling. So if you have a 10 by 10 matrix, it scales at 10 to power six. If you, scale, if you have two five by five matrices, you have two, five to the six. So you get a difference between five to the six and 10 to the six, which is pretty substantial. Okay? So just to bring this down to Earth, let me give you an example. Suppose that I want to minimize x14 subject to the fact that x has to be positive semi-definite, and then just have a single constraint. When you look at the correlative sparsity graph, I, x14 is my objective, therefore I have an edge between one and four, and then x12, x13, and x23, all of them appear in my constraints, so that's why I have edges in the graph. Okay? So if you try to optimize this, turns out that the variables that I mark with question marks in that matrix, you don't need to know the value of those variables. The only reason you will have to find those is to guarantee that your matrix X is positive semi-definite. But if I use Grant's theorem and into the decomposition, since they don't appear in the objective, I don't need their value. I just need to know that they exist. So I can do a chordal decomposition on the graph and I have two clicks. Okay? So essentially, instead of having to deal with a single semi-definite constraint that's four by four, in here I have two semi-definite constraints. One has dimension three and one has dimension two. And then the complexity of the problem is dominated by the three by three matrix. In other words, as it turns out, when you're solving an SDP, the complexity of the problem is dominated by the size of the maximum click in the underlying graph, or the tree width. Okay. Doesn't mean much now. I'm going to make a connection between this size or the click and the size of the click and some, something that's actually very intuitive in control systems or in system theory. But keep this in mind, because everything that I'm going to say next, it's, it comes from here. The fact that don't just take a huge SDP and try to solve it, look at the structure, and this, if this graph is very sparse, then you can use that to your advantage and substantially reduce the computational complexity. Okay. So let me give you one example from identification of 
switch ARX models, or since we're having an LPVS in here, you can think of this as identifying an LPV system where your scaling parameter only has a finite number of values. Okay? Um, you can connect this with a classical brain machine learning. I mean, each one of your subsystems, it's linear, therefore, the data generated by each one of your subsystems lives in a subspace. So, I give you a bunch of points, and what you need to do is subspace clustering. I give you a bunch of points, and you have to put those points into hyperplanes, okay? Why is this problem hard? The problem is hard because you don't have the labels. I mean, if you knew which points were blue, which points were yellow, take all the blue points, do a least square fit, end of story. You find the dynamics of one of your subsystems or the other, okay? If I don't have the labels for the points, but if I have, I know that this is the blue hyperplane and this is a yellow hyperplane, I just compute the distance and I assign, I paint my points according to the smallest distance to a hyperplane. But in here, you have to do, at the same time, labeling and find a hyperplane. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, which at the end of the day, it's well known that this is an NP-hard problem. Okay? So it turns out that you can also reformulate this as a quadratically constrained quadratic program. Let's assume here that I have only two subsystems or two hyperplanes, or your scaling parameter only has two values. I mean, if, say, if we're thinking in terms of what Ricardo is doing, say we have hypoglycemia and normal, or I mean, we could have three. So what I need to do here is I need to identify big A and big C for each one of the hyperplanes, okay? How do you turn this into a QCQP? You put a set of indicator variables, blue and yellow. So yellow is going to be one if the point gets assigned to a yellow hyperplane, and it's going to be zero otherwise. And blue, it's the same. Okay? So those are the first two equations. The third equation in there, SI equals SI squared. That means that S, the indicator variable, has to be zero and one. By the way, if you have a friend that's doing nonlinear programming, don't show this to them. Because, I mean, they, they go crazy. They, this is when the worst possible way of handling intersection constraints. Okay? Except that it's not. But we, we'll see why. Okay? And then, so I'm imposing that S has to be in 0, 1. And then the summation imposes that each point has to be assigned either to blue or yellow. I cannot leave points on assigned. Okay? So by the time you collect all of this, you get a collection of inequalities like this. I mean, it doesn't matter. The first one tells you to which point a hyperplane you're closer. The second one says that S has to be in zero one variable. The third one makes sure that each sample gets assigned to one subspace. The last two ones are regularization constraints that I need. But at the end of the day, this is a QCQP. So we can go ahead and solve it, either using what I show you, or, I mean, if you're a friend of Pablo Parrillo, you call him up and you get SOS tools. If you're coming from Toulouse and you know Jean-Bernard Lasser, you talk to him and he will give you Glob Tipoli and you try to fit this to Glob Tipoli, right? But either way, I mean, you do it with sum of squares or you can do this with uh, moments. And guess what happens? I mean, you write a hor you, you die, I mean, you write an LMI and then you die a horrible death. And the reason you die a horrible death is that because the scaling is horrible, okay? So, I mean, by the time you're talking about 100 points in two planes in R3, you're talking about something like 10 to the 6, okay? So with this, the best we can do is we can do CISID of a second order system with maybe 100 points. That's it. I mean, that's not very realistic, okay? Why? Well, we know that the problem is NP-hard, but we're being stupid here. Because if you actually look at the underlying graph, you find something like this. Each one of those indicator variables, the one that tells you is each point has to be yellow or blue, are decoupled from the others. The only coupling you have is through the model parameters. So when you look at the maximum click in here, the size of the click is the size of your model or model plus one. Or the tree width of the graph is the size of your model plus one. Okay, what does all of this mean? It means that computational complexity is not determined by the number of points. Computational complexity is actually determined by the error of your model. If you do things right, things, actually you can get an algorithm that scales linearly instead of polynomially with the number of data points. So if you use sparsity, you get something that's linear in the number of points, it's still horrible scaling with the dimension of your space. But we know that the problem is NP-hard. 
So this algorithm actually has the correct scale. Okay? And in here, you can actually solve decent size reasonable problems. So again, we end up solving a convex problem, but we're going solving a smart convex problem rather than just getting this huge SDP and throwing it to any of your favorite SDP solvers. Okay? But the take home message in here is that there's, I mean, this click size is not something abstract that no one can understand what it is. It's actually a very interesting connection with system theory. The size of the click, the computational complexity, is given by the order of your model. And it scales badly with the order of your model. So you want easy problems, use low order models. Duh. I mean, that's what we teach our students, right? I mean, we need to use low order models for a number of reasons, but one of them is that the computational complexity is directly related to the order of the model. All right, so just a, a quick example. This is something we did. I just wanted to show you an application. So we're trying to do here human activity analysis. So we have one person walking, and we're trying to decide how many activities are in there. And actually, if you see that some frames were corrupted because we were getting this over a wireless link, so there was interference. And we ran it, and we were able to tell that there were two activities in there. We were able to identify liars and so on and so forth. So actually, we can use this, and we have used this for human activity recognition, anomaly detection, finding out when things are non-kosher, and so on and so forth. So I'll come back to this later, but it works. OK, so you can say, well, I mean, this works for CISID. How about control? Do we have a similar situation in control? And the answer is yes. So let me talk a little bit about L1 switch control. Again, you can think of this as L1 LPV control when your parameter has only a finite number of values. Okay. How did I get involved in this? I got involved in this because we're writing a proposal on additive manufacturing or 3D printing. So we spun a really nice story to the National Science Foundation saying, look, um, 3D printers have the opportunity for very rich actuation because they have lots of actuators. You also need control because, I mean, when you're doing the position in 3D printing, if there's um, an error or an imperfection at the bottom layer and you keep printing, you spend a lot of money and time. At the end of the day, you have to throw away whatever you printed. So it is, can we use feedback control to minimize imperfections? And that's how it becomes an L-infinity to L-infinity induced norm. You're trying to minimize imperfections, or if there's an imperfection at one layer, you try to sort of compensate for that in the next layer. Okay. And obviously, we sort of managed to get convinced NSF. We got about $2.5 million to do this. Okay. So mathematically, I'm giving you a, a switch system. Again, or think of this as an LPV. And I want to design a switch controller so that the worst case, L infinity to L infinity norm, it's minimized. Okay. So if this was the L2 to L2 norm, we're done. I mean, we talked to Jose. Jose will tell you how to do H2 minimization for um, switch systems. But the problem is that, as far as I know, there's no tractable characterization of the infinity to infinity induced norm. Okay? And in this particular problem, this is a relevant performance spec. I mean, I could try to use weighting functions to do L2 to L2 instead of L2. It doesn't work. Okay? So this is the problem I'm going to try to solve. Since there's no tractable characterization of the L infinity induced norm, I'm going to cheat because I don't know how to solve this problem. So rather than imposing stability, I'm going to impose something that's called super stability. This is something that we worked with Franco Blanchini in the early 2000s. Also, Mark Halpern and Boris Poliak work on this. And you say, essentially, that a system is super stable if the hypercube is your Lyapunov function. I mean, I can go through the math, but essentially what it means to means is that the, you're imposing that the hypercube is your Lyapunov function. What do you gain by this? What you gain by this is that if you impose super stability, you get L infinity performance for free. Because the moment you impose super stability, you can actually show that there's an invariant set associated with that. You never get outside the invariant set, and therefore you have guaranteed L infinity performance. Okay? So there are two reasons to use super stability. One of them is that I get guaranteed L infinity performance. I mean, it may not be optimal, but at least guaranteed. And the second one is I get problems that I can solve. Okay. So without going into many 
details. Now I change stable to super stable, and what you can show is that the problem is solvable if a bunch of conditions in here, matrix type conditions, are satisfied. And it's a feasibility problem. Um, there's a very nice intuitive explanation in here. You have for getting L infinity to infinity performance in here, you need your sweet system to be stabilizable, and then each one of the modes has to satisfy your performance. So it's kind of interesting because as long as you have something that's switch stable, then you, need, you don't need to consider the, the transitions. You need to just super stabilize each one of the frozen modes and you're done. Okay. But, okay. Ah. Microsoft uh, Word, I mean, PowerPoint strikes again. Apologies for that. Sorry, I just gonna, I'd rather do this and. Okay, so you need to make sure that this problem is solvable. How do we do this? Right? Again, you look at this and you say, well, there are a bunch of equations in here that are fine in your variables. Those are great. The other ones that are more complicated are polynomial, right? No big deal. Because, I mean, we have affine constraints, we have polynomial constraints. Again, you talk to Pablo, you talk to Lasser. What you're having to do in here is feasibility of a semi-algebraic set. Feasibility of a set that's defined by a collection of polynomial inequalities. So you use a positive Stellensatz, turn this into a convex relaxation, you're done. Okay, from a theoretical standpoint, you're done. Okay? Uh, just need to write down the equations. The problem is that, again, same deal. You try to do this in a non-intelligent way. Just throw glob to poly or just do your moments relaxation, and again, you die a horrible death. Because the scaling is terrible. Okay? Now, it's still good enough that you can certainly write a paper and get it in CDC. If the reviewers are generous, you can get it in TAC, maybe, because you do sort of an example with two systems, second order. But remember, we got $2.5 million from NSF. NSF isn't going to be happy we say, look, we can show, solve for a toy problem. I mean, we promised to them that we were going to solve the 3D printing problem. So we better find out a way of actually scaling this up to decent sized problems. Guess what? When you look at the correlative sparsity graph, again, you get a familiar pattern where you have things that are sparse. There's one node at the top that's a commonly open function, and then each one of the leaves on the tree are essentially all the variables to a single subsystem. So if you actually use sparsity, then the problem in here scales linearly with the number of subsystems. Essentially, the complexity that you have is the complexity of solving for a single system, and then multiply that times the number of systems that you have. If you don't use this, if you use just an SDP, then things scale like number of subsystems times the order of subsystem, all of that power six, you die. Whereas in here, again, the computational complexity is given by the tree width, which happens to be the size of the click, which one model, which happens to be, guess what? Order of the model. So this is actually what explains what makes problems in our community different from the problems in machine learning. The fact that we have interrelated data translates into interconnected graphs. And the parameter that the, tells you the size or the scaling on that graph happens to be the order of the model. So at least, um, just give you an example. I mean, if I don't use sparsity, I have something that has 4,300 variables. Good luck trying to solve this using your regular um, SCP solver. On the other hand, if I use sparsity, I go down from 4,000 variables to 200 variables. I mean, again, and keeping in mind that things scale polynomially with that number, this is very, very substantial. Okay? But what's interesting in here is that, in some sense, now I can answer the question of 
what is big data for control systems? Or what's the big data for system theory? And it turns out that computational complexity doesn't, for us, doesn't have anything to do with the dimension of your feature vector or the output vector. The one on the left that has a bunch of data but they are not connected, I mean, that would be a zero order system, that's an easy problem. The one on the right, where, I mean, that's kind of a Hankel matrix that signifies I mean, interconnections between systems, that's a hard problem. Or potentially could be a hard problem because if you have a 100th order model or 50 order model, that's the dimension of your click, and all your algorithms are going to scale badly with your uh, that dimension. So again, what's the take-home message from, from this talk? Computational complexity in control systems is actually related to of your model. We all know that, but you actually can put some teeth into that. Because now you have this connection between the order of the model and this underlying graph that tells you the computational complexity of the optimization problem that you're trying to solve. And so, again, what we've been telling our students all the time, use low order models. You're a lot better off using a lower order model with less fidelity than trying to get a very high order model that has more fidelity to your data, which would be uncertain anyway, but you get problems that you cannot solve. So use low order models, not only because the order of your model reflects in the order of your controller, but the order of your model is a parameter that makes your optimization problem scale badly. So we all knew that. I mean, we all know that we should use within reason low order models, but this is sort of puts a little bit more teeth into that, okay. So this is kind of the end of this part of the talk. Um, I just want to take 10 minutes to show you something that's related to sparsity. It's not related to convexity, but I think this is an interesting re um, area where we can move into as a community and we can solve some interesting problems. So the issue is learning, okay? Everyone talks about learning these days, but how do we learn in dynamical systems, and is there a connection between learning, sparsity, and dynamics? Okay, perfect. So let's talk about learning, and specifically learning in dynamical systems. I mean, there's machine learning, it's a very well developed area. There are tons of people, very, very extremely good people doing machine learning. Every time you do something with Google or they do analytics, there's someone from machine learning solving interesting problems. So why, or is it possible for us to take tools from machine learning and just go ahead and use them in our control problems? And the answer is no, our problems are different. First of all, when you look at regular machine learning problems, they do not fully exploit the underlying dynamics. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. But also, machine learning in general is predicated on the premise that you have lots of data to train. Data that you have seen before, especially if you're doing deep learning. I mean, deep learning works because they have Google-sized data sets and Google-sized computers, and they can train. Okay? So here are two examples. The first one is a V29 that lost the vertical stabilizer when they were flying. Because turbulence, what not, boom. The, they actually managed to land that. The second one, it's an Israeli fighter that got its wing blown by a missile. The pilot didn't even know that, managed to land that, and after he lands, goes, sees, looks back and says, wow, if I had noticed that, I would have bailed. But the, the point is, good luck using machine learning here. Because who is gonna let you fly an airplane without a wing, or an airplane without a vertical stabilizer so you can generate training data? Or who's gonna let Ricardo take patients into hypoglycemia or almost near death so you can get data, right? So that's what makes our problems different. I mean, most of the time, or at least a lot of times, you see data that you have not seen before. Okay? But about dynamics. I mean, what's the role of dynamics here? Suppose that I show you this. This is actually some image processing that was done. It wasn't done by me. It actually was done by a bona fide computer vision person, so it's not Mario not knowing what Mario does. I mean, it's a really good computer vision person doing image processing, finding edges. Who can tell me what's going on there? And Tobias doesn't count because he knows the answer. Anyone? Per, what's going on here? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Someone that doesn't want to give an uh, X-rated answer. 
I mean, it's very hard to tell, right? Suppose that I show you this. Can you tell me what's going on there? Obviously, right? So why? What's going on in here? What's going on in here is that your eye is actually re reacting to the temporal correlations. You're actually re reacting to the underlying dynamics. So dynamics have information, a lot of information. Okay? So for instance, if you have noise, noise are uncorrelated, which means the underlying mode is very high, you don't see anything. But if you have the dog's plane, it's highly correlated, and you actually see something. Okay? So the, the message in here is that if you have dynamics, use it. Because that's the difference between being able to tell something an easy way or not. Okay? So I would argue that one way we can approach learning in dynamical systems is that make it a CISID problem. We have a lot of tools for CISID, right? And you know the saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. So what we're going to do here is, how would we think of our systems as or your data as the output of an underlying system. You may not be able to see the system, but the data is being generated by an underlying system, and that underlying system is generally characterized by some invariance. I mean, the invariance could be rank, the invariance could be your model, and look for things when that invariant changes. And that tells you something important, and moreover, typically, the invariant itself, it's just a few parameters, so you have very, very compact representation, so you can throw away your data. That data means nothing. But actually, it carries all the information. It's the invariants that are associated with your model. Okay? So in some sense, you can make a connection with compressive sensing. The first time I learned about compressive sensing that you can get around Nyquist limit, I thought, this is magic. But no. I mean, the problem is that it works because you have a very strong prior. So I'm going to make a very strong assumption here that if this information I care about is being generated by some system in there, and if I don't know anything about my system, the simplest model, Occam's Razor, the simple model is the one that's actually probably correct. Okay? And in that case, learning becomes just an issue of sparsifying your dynamics. So let me show you what I mean. This is an, suppose that I give you a video clip, and I shuffle the frames. And then I say, can you unshuffle? Them? So you can put this as a sparsification problem find the lowest order sparse, sparse system that explains your data in a given dictionary. And guess what? Your dictionary here are first and are the impulse response of first and second order systems. So we're using the dynamics and essentially we're looking for a low order representation of the frames. Okay? And guess what happens? The one on the left it's the one that's been shuffled. The one on the right, it's, I, mean, I was able to unshuffle this just by solving this specification problem. By the way, I mean, we presented this as one of the top computer vision conferences that have acceptance rate less than 30%. So this is not just a toy problem that we're solving for the control community. We're actually solving relevant problems for the computer vision community by using tools from our community. Why? Here's another example. I and mean, the people for Toulouse will appreciate people playing rugby, right? So suppose that all of us go to a game and we take snapshots and post in Facebook or whatnot, but suppose that somehow you don't post the timestamps. So you don't know when things were taken. You can use the same technique in here and actually get an ordering of the data. Right? All right, this is a toy example. Why is this important? Because you can do super resolution in medical imaging. I mean, suppose that you have, trying to do imaging on a child, which is typically complicated, you don't want to sedate, and it's almost quasi-periodic, but not quite. So you do several cycles, and then you intercalate like this, and you get super resolution. Okay? So here was an easy problem. But the issue is, how do we know sparsity? Because the problem is that sparsity sometimes is hidden from you. So if I show you this, is this sparse? In what sense? I mean, I don't see sparsity there. But if I take the data points, arrange them in a strange matrix that all of you know, and look at the singular value of the composition of that matrix, I have only four non-zero singular values. Why? Of course, because I work backwards. I generated something as a fourth order uh, system, and then from there I generated time response. So the idea is that, again, I mean, typically I show this slide to 
Um, typically, I show these slides to people that do not have a controlled background, so they don't know what a Hankel matrix is, but you know that. <laughs> so suppose that I have that sequence, that video sequence in there, and I take points from the, in this case, we just took the uh, coordinates of the centroid, and you arrange this in, the, in a Hankel matrix. You know the rank of the Hankel matrix tells you the or, order of the minimal realization that you need to explain this, and moreover, every single model that explains this lives in, a, in the null space of the Hankel matrix. So if I give you two time series, and I ask you, are they the same time series or not, all you need to do is Hankelize them and see if the, the Hankel matrices have the same null space. They don't even have to overlap. You never have to have seen that series before. I mean, and again, good luck doing this with just regular machine learning. So, I mean, Eugenio just told me that I have 10 minutes, so very quickly, some applications. One of them is actually anomaly detection. So we have two people that they met. You're gonna see two people that meet and exchange a box and turn around. What we're doing is look at the right-hand side, we're monitoring the Hankel rank. See the Hankel rank change? That's where the two guys met and changed something. So you can actually analyze lots and lots of data and find interesting things when the invariant changes. The invariant in here is the order of the model, okay? Very, very simple-minded thing, but for instance, if you come to, come to my lab, we have a very short MATLAB thing running that if you walk in, in front of the camera, nothing happens, but if you walk, jump, or do something else, it will get flagged as an anomalous activity. So you have data-driven, purely data-driven activities. So um, just a few other examples. Trying to classify robust time series. In here, we're trying to compare the angle between subspaces. Turns out that that's not a good metric, so we actually embed this in a Riemann manifold using positive semi-definite matrices. But at the end of the day, the, it depends on which metric you use in the manifold, but all of the gray things are ours. This is the success rate you had. The top ones, the white ones, was the state of the art when we presented this paper. So coming from outside the computer vision community, we had a tool that actually worked much, much better than the state of the in computer vision. Why? Because they don't use dynamics. Here we use dynamics and sparsity, sparsity in terms of rank. So two more examples I want to show you. One of them is state of the art in tracking. It's called tracking by detection. You find things that look similar and you try to stitch them. But in here, good luck, because all the, I mean, we cook this example so that the balls look the same, the heads look the same. But the dynamics are not the same. So what you need to do is you need to do an assignment, a Hungarian assignment problem, where you use the rank as the weighting function. And once you do this, you can do things like this. You can keep labeled identity even if these things look the same. We also present this at a computer vision conference. Actually, we're very proud because it was an oral, and the acceptance rate for orals was 2%. So again, it's something that's been validated by other communities. I mean, tools from our, our community can solve things and the last one I want to show you, this is trying to find correlated activities between humans. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side, it's a basket game, and I'm trying to find out who interacts with whom. You can put this as an optimization problem. You say, interactions are a dynamical system, and what you need to do is you need to sparsify the graph, and you see in there, I mean, it's really interesting, the arrows actually identify people from the same team, and for instance, you can see there's that arrow between the guy on the right, you're gonna see it in here. It's not apparent why, and then at the end you see that this guy is going like this, asking for the ball. We did not do a semantic analysis in here. This is completely data-driven coming from the data, just optimizing these finding sparse solutions to a set of equations that have a Hankel structure. Okay. So the bottom line is sparsity can help you with the course of dimensionality. Just look for sparsity sometimes. It's not easy to find. I mean, sometimes it's hidden in your correlative sparsity graph, Sometimes it's here in your Hankel matrix, but that's the only way that we as a community will get something that actually scales rightly. And if you have the chance to actually design your plant, try to design something that has a small uh, tree width or lower order models. And there are a few things that I didn't talk, I don't have time, but the same way we're talking about convexity, um, submodularity also helps quite a bit in some of our problems. So. That's it. Um, thanks again to organizers, to the audience. And this is 
not my work, I mean, it's part of my work, but this is work of a ton of people, and especially my colleague, Professor Octavia Kam, she's a computer vision person, so everything that you see here from computer vision that works is actually her work. Thank you.